Hi, welcome to Conversations in Interventional Cardiology. My name is Andy Goldswag, and I'm the director of the Cardiac Cath Lab at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts, and associate editor of JSky, the Journal of the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions. I'm honored to represent JSky and our editor-in-chief, Dr. Alexandra Lansky. You can find us online at jsky.org, J-S-C-A-I dot O-R-G, and follow us on Twitter at at myjsky, at M-Y-J-S-C-A-I. JSky is home to all official Sky documents, and we're here today to discuss a very important recent review article published in JSky entitled Update on Radiation Safety in the Cath Lab, Moving Toward a Lead-Free Environment. We have an esteemed panel of internationally renowned experts with us today. Uh, joining us is Dr. Morton Kern, senior author of the paper, chief of cardiology at the VA Hospital in Long Beach, California, and professor of medicine at UC Irvine. Uh, Dr. David Reisick, uh, a leader in the field of radiation reduction and director of structural heart and coronary interventions at Honor Health in Scottsdale, Arizona. And Dr. William Nicholson, director of interventional cardiology and associate professor at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining. Uh, turning to you, Dr. Kern, uh, congratulations uh, on this important paper. Uh, this is really the most comprehensive contemporary review of radiation safety in the cath lab. Uh, the paper describes several tremendous advances in radiation protection. I wonder if you could take us through the document uh, with a brief summary of, uh, kind of the most important points for radiation protection. I know you've prepared some slides to share. Okay, so it's a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to discuss uh, radiation safety in the cath lab. As uh, many of you may know, uh, this has been a, a career uh, goal, working in the cath lab, uh, educating in the cath lab, and protecting our uh, colleagues, workers, and patients in the cath lab from the uh, ubiquitous radiation field that we live in. So this paper was prompted by uh, the JSky editor, Alexandra Lansky, who invited us to do an update on radiation safety. Now, many years, there have been lots of papers on radiation and radiation safety and techniques to reduce it, but I thought this was taking a, a new look at it and how to move forward because by being exposed to my colleagues who have um, had some action, some uh, interaction with the new devices where the lead is now not necessary because protection was so good in that special environment, I thought this document would help do that. I want to thank uh, Ariel Rogan from uh, Technion Institute in Israel as a, as a premier mover and shaker and my cardiology fellows who uh, collaborated with us, Dr. Wu, Kohan, Gall, Nasser, and Petamon. And uh, we covered a fairly large uh, swath of radiation. Now, for, we started just with the fundamentals. Radiation is a, a function of predominantly exposure through scatter. As the beam enters the patient, it scatters around the whole room. So part of our protective approach is to keep that scatter to a minimum, block trans, transit of that radiation to our workers and, and colleagues. Uh, we discussed some of the population at risk, the cath lab team, uh, women, pregnancy. We addressed techniques to monitor. Real-time monitoring seemed to be a very important aspect. That is, if you're wearing a button and get immediate feedback and you're spending too much time in a hot zone, you need to step out. We discussed some of the new equipment and techniques of the uh, generation of x-rays and the x-ray equipment. We talked about operator technique was probably the oldest and most boring aspect of radiation protection, but it's among the most important. We talked about um, uh, radial versus femoral approaches because now radial has the potential to have higher exposure, but when done well, it, ha it does not. And it's a very uh, excellent technique in all other respects than femoral access. We covered remote uh, performance, robotic performance of the procedure so the operator could be entirely withdrawn from the radiation environment. And then we talked about new new and novel techniques. So just to, to review, we covered the zone of radiation, source, shielding, scatter, that the angulation of the tube was a problem, that tube height to patient was a problem, that improper positioning of shielding was a problem. And of course, if you're not wearing the right lead, you're going to be in trouble. These were some of the novel devices that we addressed briefly. Um, uh, we talked about the zero gravity system in the upper right. We talked about new mobile shielding systems in the lower left, the remote robotic technique in the middle on the bottom, and then some uh, additional 
rad pads or other shielding, some encompassing the patient as a, a major way to protect radiation scatter. We covered the Agnes, the Rampart, the Protego systems, which I think here, herein lie the, the gist of a radiation-free environment, and that is encapsulating the tube and the patient in a radiation protective environment, and then everyone else is free. We um, had our first exposure to this system. That's a funny word, but we were working with the Protego system about a month ago. And uh, they, and I took the word of David or Isaac, who's with us. I took the word that says, okay, my exposure will be zero. They gave me a, a lead badge, a, a monitoring badge. I took my lead off. I put my uh, sterile gown over my scrubs. Now, just to remind everyone, this is a, a room full of personnel, especially for complex cases and pacemakers and all kinds of things. But several people are going to be up in the radiation hot zone. And if we put our Protego shield in, in this case, we protect 80% of people in the room. If you're above that, you won't be protected. So I thought this was remarkable. And indeed, this was us doing our first case. And I uh, wrote a little editor's page on this recently with David and uh, Arnold Cito and, and discussed it. But this felt like I was working in my underwear. And at the end of the case, I walked out. My back didn't hurt. My feet didn't hurt. And my badge read zero. On the other side of the lead protection, on the other side of the Protego system, the badge read 11 millirems. So there is no doubt we have stepped into a new world of radiation protection. So that was the paper. These are some of the pictures. Uh, David has done a thousand cases. I'm exaggerating, but a lot of cases with this. And I think the future, we're looking at the future. Bill, are you using such a protective system? Yeah, I mean, that's a great presentation. I think uh, we're not using Protego, we're using Rampart. And, you know, in full disclosure, I am on their advisory board, but uh, we've had that. Uh, for about three years now. Uh, so we've had the experience that you had of feeling uh, free in the lab without uh, lead on. So we um, use it in virtually all of our complex cases uh, at Midtown Hospital. I, I don't even know where my lead is. I haven't worn lead in, in quite a while. And so uh, it's really nice. I mean, it's very similar kind of conceptually as far as uh, getting all the staff out of lead, which is very attractive. So it's not just uh, some of the things like uh, you know, Corindus or, or uh, zero gravity, you know, the, the doctor's protected, but the staff is still uh, getting exposed. So anybody basically from the patient's waist to the south uh, is, is lead free during the case. So all the fellows and all the scrub techs and, and the circulator still wears lead because they get on the other side of the shield. But uh, it is, it's fantastic. You know, our structural guys use it in all their complex cases virtually all the time, or EP people use it all the time. And so uh, it's been three years at, at two two of the major hospitals in, in our system uh, that we've had it, and it's it's really made a dramatic change. You know, I, I missed a, a good month of work back uh, at my previous institution from issues with uh, wearing lead constantly, and uh, you know, it, it takes a toll on you. And I mean, I'm tw 20 years into this, I'm not as far along as some of you guys, but uh, but uh, you know, it's a uh, it's it's been a dramatic change. It really has. Yeah, to throw that up to us, didn't you, Bill? Yeah, I thought maybe. Yeah. I Remind you guys. So let me, Dan. Before you take it, let me let me just ask a question, if you don't mind, Andy. That there are some cases in which the lead at this moment, the lead shielding systems, the Protego and the Rampart, uh, can't cover completely. So who who are those people? David, have you had that problem? Well, um, I would say this. We tweeted out uh, last Friday's cases. I don't know if you saw the tweet. We did an alcohol septal ablation. We did a tavern, we did a mitra clip. And the primary operator in those cases got zero radiation for the day. The primary operator and the first scrub uh, or and the fellow, we badged up everyone. So you can do a spectrum of cases and get the same result. Uh, and that is zero radiation. And you mentioned our study that was published in JSky, in that 68% of the cases, there was absolutely zero radiation uh, exposure to the operator. And uh, Andy wrote a beautiful editorial and described in the cases that where there was some detection on the ray safe uh, badge, it was minuscule, so minuscule as to be less than what you would get 
um, you know, if you wore standard lead apron uh, protection. So we think that with the Protego, and I don't have the experience with Rampart that Bill has. Bill's a really expert with this. We think with the Protego, and hopefully this will extend to the other systems, um, that you can do a spectrum of cases with a uh, negligible uh, radiation exposure. Well, David, let me just follow up on that. Let me ask you, uh, you know, you you uh, obviously showed with Protego, uh, you can reduce operator radiation exposure by 99 plus percent. Uh, it seems like, uh, as Mort said, we've entered a whole new world. What what further research is necessary in this space? What further innovation is necessary in, in the field of reducing operator exposure? That That's what Bill O'Neill used to tell me, uh, Andy, you're never supposed to tell the person who asks the question, that's a great question, but that is a great question. And and we do need iteration. I would say a couple of things. I would say um, in terms of iteration, we have to uh, learn how to protect other people in the room. Certainly everyone south of this protective barrier is protected. The first scrub, the nurse, et cetera, the fellow. However, who is not protected, and this is going to be very important, is the anesthesiologist and the doctor running the uh, transesophageal echocardio, uh, echocardiogram probe. At, half of our cases at Honor Health are cases that require anesthesia. And so far, we really don't have adequate protection. And when I say adequate protection, the aspirational goal for everybody in the room has to be zero radiation. So I believe Rampart, Protego, and whoever else is jumping into this space needs to figure out a way to protect the echocardiographer, to protect the anesthesiologist. Their exposure is significant. And if we are going to meet that aspirational goal of zero radiation, uh, that's what we need to do. And the second answer, wh what else do we have to do? We got to get buy-in. We have to get buy-in from administrators, people in the C-suite in these big hospital systems, uh, even you know managers of cath labs who say, gee, there's, there's an added five or six or seven minute turnaround time. My answer is, who cares? If we can reduce radiation to zero or, to use your words, minuscule, who cares if you add five or six minutes to the case? You know, there are over 30 interventional cardiologists, radiologists who've developed left-sided brain tumors, and that's, that's, that's old data. It's probably much more by now. Um, to save one of those lives, uh, much more 30 or 40, this five-minute investment is worth it. Last point, Andy. It takes us less than two minutes to set it up. Once you get your, once you become facile with this, to set it up for TAV or advanced coronary cases, it's less than two minutes. And now we're using it for pretty much all of our TAVers and coronary cases. But we need to get buy-in from decision makers. Well, I, I'm sold. Uh, but of course, I'm an interventional cardiologist. Let me uh, let me pick up on what you just said. I want to fire this question at Dr. Nicholson. Uh, Bill, you work at a major health system uh, in Atlanta that cares for a large underserved population. And I uh, can't say I know the administrators to your health system, but at least at my health system, they seem to care a lot more about the bottom line than they do about radiation protection data. Um, so my question is, how can interventional cardiologists obtain these improved radiation protection technologies? How can we justify essentially unreimbursed costs to our health system? Yeah, it's a, it's a major sticking point. I mean, and I think what you allude to uh, is very true with a lot of health systems that are not for profit, but they're obviously for profit. And so, you know, I think that the bottom line is what matters and it's a hard sell, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's about one of the most disappointing things uh, and, and one of the biggest kind of slap in the face as you can have is, I mean, it basically telling you, we don't really care about your welfare. You know, it's about the, the, the bottom line for the health system. Uh, it's about patient care is primary and, and the healthcare worker, uh, largely the physicians get, get left behind. And we've had numerous times uh, that, that uh, we've uh, had other institutions. They've been very receptive at Emory. Uh, you really got amazingly no, no resistance. So they, they bought in right away. Uh, so kind of the technology and the and a benefit to the uh, to the physicians and the staffs, but in the staff members. But uh, you know, I think that's not the case everywhere. You know, in, in multiple multiple institutions that have called me and asked, "How did we get it in there?" You know, because their their administrators are saying no. 
Uh, I think it's a it's a it's a major shortcoming uh, on the uh, concerns or care of the healthcare systems. Now, you know, I think there's other avenues that we've gone uh, to give advice to people. You know, you, you obviously have uh, foundations and charitable donations, and multiple places have used that that has been able to pay for the uh, for the uh, systems. Uh, you know, and, and the final one that that uh, you know, one is a, is a good recruiting tool. You know, right now it's hard to get staff everywhere, and you know, and so I think if you tell staff that are looking at your institution that you know you're going to get to work without lead, uh, you know, I think that's very attractive to to techs and nurses. So I mean, I think it does have a, a ancillary benefit for the health system from a recruitment standpoint and a retention standpoint. Uh, so I think that is one thing. I think the other part too is. Many of us, uh, you know, what, 60% of us are going to have spine issues, you know, after 20 years of doing this. I mean, and shockingly, a quarter of people less than five years out are going to have it. And so you have real HR reasons to require some sort of radiation protection in your in your cath lab. And I think, you know, when you bring it to that level, uh, it's hard for them to say no. I mean, you're, you're going to them and saying that you have a legitimate concern about your safety and protection at work. And their job is to provide a safe, uh, maximally safe environment for you to work in. And so HR has been very helpful uh, at many of the institutions uh, that, we, that I've advised with or people that have called and asked for uh, if you have legitimate issues. But, you know, and that's sort of taking it out of context. That's saying legitimate issues for things we can see or tangibly feel. But, I mean, you know, the radiation aspect alone, I mean, people don't get as worked up about it because nobody can see it. But, I mean, when you look at the long-term you know, cancer and, and long-term uh, uh, detrimental effects that the radiation has. I'm not sure why you need to have a physical ailment to show somebody the the need for it. I think that you should be able to just say, "Look, I'm working in an environment where I get twice the radiation as a nuclear power plant, plant worker," and you know, I think that alone should uh, give you some some sort of cre- credibility with your administrators to protect us. Andy, can I add one other thing? Please. There, there was a beautiful manuscript in Jack Interventions in February of 2019. Selena Young wrote a manuscript, and she identified factors that uniquely dissuade women from pursuing careers in interventional cardiology. And there was a num- there were a number of factors, but one of the greatest factors was radiation exposure during childbearing years. And we know that there is data that justifies a hesitancy on women in childbearing years uh, to be exposed to radiation. If we are truly going to break down barriers uh, to women going into interventional cardiology, let's listen to what they're telling us. And one of those factors is, I don't wanna be exposed to radiation uh, during childbearing years. So that aspirational goal of zero radiation is completely consistent with this uh, Selena Young uh, paper and I, I believe in terms of not only retention, as Bill said, which is extremely important, but people choosing a career path, I think this is this is huge, and we have to get on board with this. David, I, I just want to give you a quick anecdote and then uh, comment on, on Bill, Bill's uh, statement. So the fellow that scrubbed with me on that first lead-free case was a high skeptic, like he was a, uh, happened to be a, a man, but if it was a female fellow, she would be afraid. He wore his lead because he didn't trust me and trust the lead shielding to to protect him. He had a badge. I had a badge. They both read zero at the end of the procedure. And quickly, he became a believer. Second thing is that uh, according to any any new installation of a cath lab, the big iron companies should be promoting a zero radiation feel. And so I think part of the expense can be um, incorporated into the purchase of that new cath lab equipment. Whatever it is, a couple hundred grand is nothing compared to the big cost, the overall cost, and of course the the benefit. And then the third point, I just want to close with: there is some potential liability of a hospital administrator denying best care to the cath lab workers, not necessarily the physicians only. That is, you know, they bear some responsibility for creating an environment that is really safe, safer, and better. Lead reduces exposure, yes, but it's associated with occupational injury. The lead-free environment is where the best safety results are at a modest cost. And then, of course, we buy a lot of cath lab gear, which they don't have any problem with. You know, an OCT machine, a pullback system, a co-register system, that's a hundred grand. And, you know, that's the same price as a lead-free uh, uh, shield uh, installation. And they shouldn't be able to balk at those things. So I think that part of it 
is also the companies haven't done the best job they can yet to sell this stuff. That is, I think the Protego is behind on their production and and sales force and installation teams and so on. Uh, it's going to be months before we get that unit installed in our cath lab. That was our, our demonstration period. So I think this is a no-brainer going forward that cath labs shouldn't have to work in the old way, in the radiation-rich environment. Let's get rid of it. There you have it. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Curran, Dr. Rizek, Dr. Nicholson. We're really thrilled to include this important paper in the ninth issue of JSKY and to share this discussion uh, with this incredible panel. To all of our listeners, please follow JSKY. Uh, submit your own work to JSKY. JSKY is the official journal of Sky, and you can find us at jsky.org, J-S-C-A-I.org, and on Twitter at, at @myjsky. Thank you very much. Thank you.